For those of you who are new to the DMM community, I am Stephanie Wilson, a forensic psychologist and host of the DMM community. This evening, we have Dr. Andrea Landini speaking for us. Andrea is a child and adolescent psychiatrist and a psychotherapist. He is also the director of the Family Relations Institute, which alongside IASA sponsors the DMM community. Andrea has worked extensively with Dr. Patricia Crittenden and other colleagues to develop the DMM as we see it today. Today, he is here to talk to us about DMM integrative treatment. And so he's going to do a talk for us and then take some questions. So feel free to note down any questions that you have in the chat and then we will come to you afterwards. So we are going to be recording the session. So we will ask everyone to mute their microphones and over to you, Andrea. Thing that I should clarify immediately. What we mean with uh, DMM integrative treatment is not a new model of treatment, is not a technique, it's not an alternative to existing approaches to treatment. It's rather a way to make sense of what to use with whom to paraphrase a famous uh, book, a series of books by Peter Fonagy and other co-authors, What Works For Whom. And we will talk in terms of how it's very misleading to think in terms of general treatments. Uh, as you perhaps know, one of the basic ideas in the DMM is that psychiatric diagnosis, the DSM or the ICD descriptive diagnosis don't really work clinically. They are not useful. They are uh, actually often misleading. So there is no such thing as treating a mental illness or a mental disorder. Rather, we'll have to work with people, we'll have to work in terms of relationships. And there's a lot of techniques, there's a lot of models of treatment, and DMM integrative treatment can probably be best conceptualized as a set of principles. They are not yet set in stone. So if you've heard um, some uh, other presentation by me or others, it might be that the principles are stated somewhat differently. I'm giving you a new version, tonight's DMM integrative treatment principles. The substance is pretty uh, defined. The form is today's form. So here we go. Five principles tonight. The first one, define problems in terms of response to danger. If you're familiar with the DMM, you know that this is the basic idea underlying the model. And so it's the basic idea underlying treatment that is coherent with the model. Second principle, be a transitional attachment figure. Treatment is done by people. Computers have been tried. It's not really clear that uh, computer-generated treatment is desirable or even uh, efficient. If we're interacting among people, there are reasons to consider a basic principle 
of treatment uh, that the person delivering treatment is basically, even before the treatment actions begin, is best framed as a transitional attachment figure for the very reason that people in distress seek protection and comfort. So they go to a professional hoping for protection and comfort. That's what you look for uh, from an attachment figure. Third principle, the treatment should explore the family's past and present responses to danger. So not only we define the problem in terms of responses to danger, a lot of the intervention is assessment, the specific uh, ways in which responses to danger in a family are uh, organized. Fourth principle, work progressively and recursively with the family. Meaning basically that there is a logical progression in the work that can be done in treatment, but life doesn't go according to a predefined plan, usually. Or the map is not the same thing as the territory, another way of saying it. So we will have a treatment plan that has a logical uh, organization, and then one rolls with the punches. Things happen and you are forced to set your plan aside or you don't have the resources to make everything go according to plan, you go back and work again on something you should have done before or that you thought you already did, but things will happen recursively. And that's not a reason to consider the treatment a failure. And the fifth principle is practice reflective integration. Other versions of this uh, principle were stated in terms of teach reflective integration. But as one powerful form of teaching is to model something you want to teach, then practicing reflective integration together can be a principle that informs the whole uh, work in treatment. I don't see questions in uh, chat yet, but perhaps it's too early. I don't want to finish now the formal presentation, but I think I could finish in about 10 minutes. So if you want to start thinking of points to discuss, you're welcome to. So I have prepared a few words to illustrate each of the five principles. And the first one, define problems in terms of response to danger. This has largely to do with the mindset of uh, the person uh, trying to treat patients. So there's a lot of work on um, one's perspective on the problem and on the treatment. And if this work is reflective, it's better. So what do we mean by defining problems in terms of response to danger? One idea is to explore the functional meaning of the presenting symptom or problem. So before trying to change the symptom, how does it work? How does it function in terms of the consequences and result for the person uh, enacting the behavior and for the immediate family? Does it have a protective or comforting value as well as the, uh, the problems 
for which uh, this is defined by somebody, uh, a troublesome behavior or something that should be changed. Uh, crucially, we should look for past exposure to danger and it's tied to the present. So history is crucial, is relevant, especially in terms of what were the dangers that were experienced. But also, item three in this list, look for past and current experience with comfort. In a sense, danger experienced in the past can be either damaging or enriching in terms of increasing uh, competence. And one of the crucial elements that can uh, influence development to go in one direction or the other is, was there an attachment figure at some point during development to comfort the person so that the information about past experience with danger could be processed in ways that led to learning about that experience. So it becomes important to look into past and current relationships. And as we look uh, at how persons are responding to danger or have responded to danger in the past, we are going to look especially for misapplied transformations of information. Transformations of information are strategically useful. They can supply shortcuts that make protection more uh, efficient, quicker, um, pre-attuned uh, to the most likely uh, dangers that can occur. Sometimes transformations of information get in the way of current um, needs for protection and comfort. So that is especially um, relevant area to look at. Uh, also, look for the self-protective function of the behavior and the transformations of information. And potentially make a difference. These problematic behaviors and transformations of information, are they protective in the present? Were they protective in the past? Of course, this makes a huge difference. And as you see, there's a whole lot of looking before acting on a diagnosis, on a complaint, or on a legal condition, take the time to look in, into the problem in terms of how can we frame this emergent problematic uh, behavior or status in terms of response to past or current danger. And at that point, we should be in the position to be able to choose a therapeutic action that fit the protective strategies in terms of not hyperactivating them, therefore exacerbating the problem. But the actions that fit the strategies not increasing the challenge and actually uh, pursuing the goal of protection and comfort. So this is the first principle. It has to do with assessment. Is assessment something you do before treating or is it an integral part of the treatment itself? We could consider the second of these alternatives as the more fitting with the DMM model. Also because while you assess, and here's a list of the DMM assessments that probably you, you know, as you assess, you interact with the people you're assessing. So you're basically establishing the first uh, moments of a relationship and the assessments require you take a non-judgmental 
stance, but also an inquisitive stance informed by the ideas of danger is important and how people responded to danger was good enough that they survived until now. And it might have implications for how to adapt after having survived that danger. The full definition of the problems in the DMM is usually formulated in terms of a family functional formulation. So the results of the assessment is what strategies do the family members use to protect and comfort themselves in the context of their relationships? And also, are these strategies currently adaptive or are they modified by general modifier or traumas or unresolved losses? The family functional formulation takes a look at the resources and the needs and the balance between them. It tries to define what is the critical danger organizing the family functioning. So all the strategies might be seen as interacting around one critical danger. Sometimes what is dangerous for some family members is safe, considered safe by other family members, thereby creating the potential for a conflict of interests in, within the family. Uh, the family functional formulation would also contain a hypothesis about what is the critical cause of change for the family? What is the action by somebody providing treatment that can change the state, the functional state of the family system so that the family system becomes able to adapt again. So moving out of an impasse and uh, recovering some ability to change in response to the features of the current environment. Uh, the zone of proximal development, we'll come back to this. Uh, in the family functional formulation, this is defined as the next challenge the family is ready to learn to manage. It's not easy to get to this. One has to take into account the zone of proximal development of all the family members and an, uh, an idea of what they're trying currently to do. And uh, on the basis of this, one can create a customized plan using feedback to modify the plan. This is the recursive principle. As you see, it's hard to take the principles apart. They keep uh, getting back in. Discussing one, we go to the others as well. Second principle, be a transitional attachment figure. Attachment relationships are personal. So, there is no thing in the DMM model such as a manualized treatment. By definition, treatment which is manualized is not individualized. So it's not personal. So we expect it not to work. Uh, and to be a transitional attachment figure, one, has to work in the zone of proximal development of the people one is working with. So basically, this has to do with what parents do every day. That is, find what people can do for themselves and let them do it. Find what people cannot do for themselves and in terms of uh, protection and comfort, and provide protection and comfort when people are not able to uh, achieve it, and then work interacting with people with what they're ready to learn. There are several ways to look at this. I'm giving you a quick reminder of some of the ways the DMM considers relevant. 
One is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So what are the needs that in a family are currently not um, satisfied? And that's a way to define where to start working with a family. Here's another a gradient of interventions. You see here parents' education, short-term counseling, parent-child intervention, adult psychotherapy ordered in terms of increasing resource intensity. And they're put together with parents' reflective capacity. The less uh, resource intensive type of intervention requires a high level of integration. For the lowest level of integration, one needs a more resource intensive type of intervention. Um, back to the idea of being a transitional attachment figure. Use your relationship as a window to other relationships for both assessment and treatment. Uh, differenti differentiating needs and desires. Meeting the needs, including going outside the therapy to the family and community to satisfy the needs that are currently not addressed. One could take some care in terms of avoiding meeting desires because desires uh, are more legitimately the basis for individuals forming relationships outside of a technical uh, or um, yeah, technical field in professional terms. But then regarding the needs of the family, uh, we should try to structure a reciprocal communicative process like parents with babies. So it's all about trying to establish some um, dyadic synchrony with the family members or facilitating their dyadic synchrony and working with special attention on the ruptures. We know that in the parents-babies relationship, the quality of relationships hinges on the quality of the repair of the ruptures in dyadic synchrony. And pretty much the same can be uh, said for the therapeutic relationships. So the errors, the miscommunications are a, a, a fantastic chance to practice uh, repair strategies. So clarifying miscommunication is a chance to notice psychological shortcuts or transformations of information that are relevant to understand and explain current problematic functioning. And they are also the basis for working on repairing uh, the status of the current dyadic synchrony in the therapeutic relationships. So basically, we're very lucky that errors occur during treatment. They give fantastic chances to make good things happen. Um, a, a function of the transitional attachment figure is to promote safe practice of new behavior. If current behavior is maladaptive, it's all about trying to find alternatives to this. And so the therapists would have the responsibility to graduate the process of change so that it's safe to experiment with new behavior. And we're here on the idea of demonstrating repair processes for missteps. Of course, the learning that is happening for real in the here and now of the therapy is particularly powerful. So the more therapists are not concerned, overly concerned with being caught with their pants down, the more there's a chance for seeing, for the families to see directly integration and creative reflection happening in real time.
So if the therapists can go wrong and try to repair with an inner trust that a repair is possible, this should be a powerful model for the families. Another principle, explore the family's past and present responses to danger. This draws on a huge repertoire of uh, techniques to assess and explore human functioning. So we begin with exploratory assessment, looking for discrepancies, whatever doesn't fit together, whatever is contradictory, is incoherent, that's interesting. Uh, using Mary Ainsworth uh, words, uh, the things that don't fit are where the new information is. So the discrepant stuff is interesting. Interacting with a family there is this goal of gathering a cache of shared experiences that then one can think about. But early on, one has to address disruptive arousal. Uh, very high or low arousal is usually associated with maladaptive strategies, strategies that are not working. So when there are issues uh, clear issues with arousal, they are both a sign that strategies need repair, but also it's a sign that the persons having these uh, extreme states of arousal are not comfortable. So in therapy, it's a priority to try and comfort these people, to bring up or down the arousal to a comfortable level because otherwise people will not be somatically, will not somatically feel safe enough to turn on exploratory processes, both behaviorally and mentally. So this is so crucial. Somatic information really needs attending to and active modulation with drugs, with mindfulness, with joking to perk people up, whatever you can do, regulate arousal is a priority. And then you will have intermittent trauma intrusions. Those will need noticing and addressing. Sexuality has to be considered. Always severe problems with safety and comfort go together with sexually interesting behaviors, but one has to look and to put information together. So this is an important part of exploration. In cases with substantial discrepancies that are hard to figure out, one could add formal assessment. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is, uh, We have assessments that are wonderful. And there was a question from you. What do we do in terms of trying to figure out what strategy is being used if we don't have an AI? And I was playing in my mind with an answer like, would you feel confident as a neurosurgeon uh, doing surgery without any image. Wouldn't you want an MRI or a CAT scan to work on? And the answer is yes. And they're so um, strongly associated with good information and good results that nowadays, even the patients wouldn't trust uh, a neurologist that made a diagnosis without the imaging. In a, we have yet to achieve that sort of validity for the AI. Of course, you have to have working hypotheses, but you also should 
keep in mind that um, there is an assessment. If you cannot figure out easily what is a nice falsifiable working hypothesis, then in some instances, you could go to the assessment. Uh, if the strategies are broken, so if the person knows that they're not working and yet they have no way of uh, coming up with a hypothesis of change in this strategy, then uh, a thing that could be done while exploring um, the past and present responses to danger is to try and repair the uh, strategies of the family members. And this is usually done by exploring their past adaptive advantages, which could be taken for granted. If the people have survived until now, their strategies have worked to an extent. They might not work now. And so an important part of repairing broken strategies is to uh, con contextualize them. So noticing what they were good for and what they are not currently good for. Uh, here, the, the trauma issue, assist the completion of learning from past experiences with danger. Uh, the, the DMM definition of trauma is past experience with danger that was not comforted enough to allow uh, an adequate learning from that experience. So what can be provided in the context of treatment is comfort and the occasion to process information about past danger. And then when one has basically explored all the strategic setup, identifying what the strategies are good for and what dangers are not very well um, worked with, uh, with these strategies, uh, then one can start to expand the array of strategies. And now I'm going to the fourth principle. The work is progressive and recursive. So one formulates the problem in terms of past and present family members' experience of danger. We get to a formulation. Do we share this formulation with the family? It depends on the strategies used by the family member and on their uh, developmental stage. There are things that are too complex for children to understand. We won't waste time explaining them. Or there are aspects that have to do with differentiating appearance from reality. Some strategies used by family members try to simplify that. If we try to feed them the complexity we have in our formulation, they might just reject it as dangerous. So again, we'll have to try and decide what is the zone of proximal development of each family member and of the whole family? What are they ready to learn next? So what we tell them, oh, and not in general, more awareness means more freedom of choice, but it's not so clear that increasing awareness through a semantic communication of what we think is the problem with the family is going to do anything good to the family. It will depend on how we formulate the problem for the family. Um, so we'll have to consider the needs and skills of all family member, of all family members. How do we differentiate desires from needs? Desires can be put off without anyone dying. <laughs> That's a sharp way of differentiating it, but basically it's the kind of distinction that parents have to do when, when all the family members converge home after a day at school or at work. 
some family members will have to be fed first. Others can, can fend for themselves. So that's, that's basically the, and you can go wrong. You can consider a desire. You can mistake a need for a desire and vice versa. And you have to be able to take in feedback to correct your error. Um, so we work with the family. We will meet and work directly with appropriate family members. And this in itself is a universe. We have so many choices. Uh, working with the family doesn't mean that we have to meet the whole family always. That could be a disaster. In case of a, a conflict of interest within the family, put them all together in a room, something that maybe they never do at home. If we force them to in treatment, they might kill each other or it, not in actual terms. Hopefully we would be able to stop that or, or not. We are not policemen. But sometimes things happen that are so destructive and the family didn't want to come together and we force them to explosions. Uh, we could avoid simplifying problems by assigning each family member to different therapists, but also avoid conflict of interest by insisting on, all, on seeing all family members uh, together. So we should seek the maximum benefit for everyone. It's so easy, especially when strategies involve the exaggeration of conflict to buy into the idea that we have to enter the conflict, we have to choose one side of the family to defend against someone else. Uh, the idea is that if someone in the family loses, all the family loses something. So we could focus on the process of problem resolution. Failures are most interesting, again, because they allow us to um, turn on reflective integration. So teaching integration by example, orienting the perception to discrepancies, and very often family, families try to hide under the carpet the dirt uh, that they have to deal with. So we're very interested in the dirt. I mean, we're all curious, right? We could have been journalists hunting for gossip or sex or scandal. Instead, we chose psychotherapy. That's something that I assume. I hope that I can assume that. Curiosity is, very, is an asset for people wanting to deliver treatment. Um, So if we orient perception to discrepancies, of course, we have to reframe their meaning. So we're not hunting for errors, flaws, uh, guilt, sins. We are hunting for information. We want the real dirt. We're interested in knowing everything. So that's what we're hunting for. And... So when we find these discrepancies, information has something that is usually transformed. And so the attention can be turned to how do we transform information in order to achieve protection and comfort. But when we find that these transformations are maladapted, then we can try to construct alternate dispositional representations. And then, uh, we can experiment with these, first virtually and then in behavior. When we've sort of done a run-through and it seems safe to experiment with, with new stuff, then we can do some behavioral experiments and then reflect on the result. If they fail, that's information. So there is no such thing as a mistake. The only mistake is to fail to learn from a mistake. I, I'm sure you've heard that a lot. So to summarize, treatment as an attachment process begin where each person is, so the, the notion of zone of proximal development, 
address first real dangers and then perceived dangers. And very often perceived danger that is not there in the present was there in the past. Seek comfortable and alert arousal, negotiate topics of concern, correct transformed information, build a cache of shared experience, build a cache of recalled experience, reflect and integrate. I am sure that you think this is all so general and basically it doesn't give a clear guidance on how to deal with these people, as some uh, students have called them. What do we do with these people? Well, I'd like to finish with this citation. For each complex problem, there is a solution that is simple, clear, and wrong. Now, I'll try to take some of your questions. Um, Needs and desires. Yeah, needs and desires. <sighs> In child protection, I've seen strange stuff happening. So do people, oh, we can go to the, the Maslow pyramid and we can consider the current things happening in the family as either addressing different levels of needs or just, I need to become very proficient in music. Is that a need? Self-realization, it's the top of the Maslow pyramid. So maybe, it can wait a little if the house is cold. Um, considering sexuality, well, I'm not sure what I can say about this. I guess I just want to say, keep it in mind. The adults might want to have sex every now and then. Can they do it with some privacy? Do they always have children in their beds? Do children uh, agitate and uh, regulate their arousal with self-stimulation? Do they have unfulfilled needs for comfort in terms of regulation of arousal that are pursued with sexualized actions? Um, I've told you about principles. And these principles are a sort of map to keep in mind as you navigate the territory of interacting with a family, coming to your office, kicking and screaming, saying you, you have to fix this child. And sometimes families are so convinced that they know what we should do. And we wonder why are they bothering with us if they're so convinced that. And of course, Looking at that in terms of what is the danger that they're responding to? Because there's this big discrepancy. They know what to do, and yet they want us specialists to do it. So the discrepancy should orient us in terms of what's the danger that they're trying to um, deal with, controlling our behavior, not allowing us to have our input in it. So this was just a quick example in terms of, um, I, I've given you principles and they're formulated in terms of like rules to follow. Of course, sometimes you can and sometimes you cannot. The idea of working recursively would be that when you reach an impasse, 
then maybe it's the point to review the principles. Is there something that we've been forced to skip? And maybe we can go back and see if addressing that issue unblocks the process. Uh, if we don't have access to assessment tools, are there significant indicators that you'd recommend practitioners to look out for? Yes needs, the Maslow pyramid, arousal in terms of somatic problems or depressed moods. Uh, so whatever is somatically salient will be relevant. Sexuality, especially if inappropriate, um, Yes, those indicators, very basic, but sometimes forgotten issues can point to the failure of strategies. Even before finding out what the strategy is, finding out what the strategy is, which you can do by doing a formal assessment or by forming a working hypothesis and then go uh, into interacting with the family, thinking, well, mom is rule-based. If I give her a prescription, she should find herself at ease with this structure. She will have no problem with me as an authority. So if I give her a prescription, that might make her feel safer and more comfortable. We give her the prescription, she comes back next week protesting, kicking and screaming, okay, we know our hypothesis was wrong, we have to revise it. Something surprising happened. So that's a way to use um, ideas about attachment strategies, using them as a way to generate working hypotheses, make a step, make an action, and get feedback from the family. If someone wants, are there available case examples? Yes. Look up uh, on the YASA website, the DMM publications. There's quite a list of published case studies. Would I give a case example tonight? Probably not. <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> um, what therapeutic modalities would I recommend training in? Uh, well, there's data saying that uh, therapists that are training in a model and identify with it are very broadly, somewhat more efficient than those who do not uh, identify themselves as using a model. So I would say one model that includes some work in terms of self-observation and talking about yourself with someone else. That should allow you to to practice both sides of the, of the therapeutic relationship. Being a patient in the model is a good experience to have. Can this approach be used effectively with isolated adults who exist outside of a family system? Well, these die very early, so you better be quick, whatever you do. Isolated adults, get sick and die early. So it's not the best state for health in general. Once these adults had parents and maybe siblings, so yes, they learned their strategies in the context of family relationships. Even if you don't have a whole family to work with today, Maybe the person you're working with wants a scrap of family. 
So maybe the strategies to explore are those to create and maintain new relationships with a bit of sex, if the person is an adult, an adolescent. Do certain strategies respond well to any particular clinical interventions modalities? Oh, it depends greatly. Is the strategy working or is it broken? You don't mess with the strategy that is working. If the person is compliant, compulsively compliant, within a family that has a very domineering, crucial member, do you really want to change that strategy before you changed something in the behavior of the domineering person? So I guess I don't, we don't have time left, but even if I had time, I would play the frustrating person, the irritant, the irritant saying, you don't treat a strategy. First, you have to see what the problem is. Why is the strategy not working if it's not working? And you can find out that the identified patient using a strategy is using it in a way that holds the family together. So even if the family brings you the patient as the problematic one, like uh, oppositional defiant disorder in children, cure that, and in a substantial proportion of cases, the parents might divorce. <laughs> so the idea is sometimes the strategy is doing a good job to protect the family members. And in a sense, I'm, I'm, I will try to be less irritant and say something more in tune with the question. Usually, if you're dealing with a person that you hypothesize uses a cognitively based strategy, when you want to play safe, use semantic communication, give them prescriptions. That's the way to play, to work with the strategy. So if you need to have the arousal of the person go down, play into the strategy so that they can feel safer and introduce the information they are used to omit, not use, not regulate. Introduce it gradually. Once the person is safe with you and you can, they can count on the therapeutic relationship as a proper attachment relationship. On the other hand, if you need to perk up a person whose expectations are zero, they have an expectation of complete futility, then you can challenge them with unexpected new information, you can surprise them. So I think I don't want to give rules here. It really depends on the family functional formulation and how you feel in terms of what I could do with this family or we could do if you're a team. So really it's about finding an overlapping area of functioning between people, not disorders, not techniques. So going back to the idea that uh, being a transitional attachment figure means being there as a person. Could I please say something about motivating members of the family from the DMM integrative treatment principles? Hmm. I, I am assuming that this is about how do I take the presented problems, the way that the family sees it and defines it, how do I bring them to my perspective, if I think something has to be done about this problem that it's not what the, what the family is thinking, 
the principle helping here is the idea of if I have to build an attachment relationship, transitional, not permanent, I don't have a big enough house to bring home all the patients. I don't want it permanent. I've had a couple, but enough, thanks. Um, I have to start where they are. So I can motivate them to go one step in the direction that they can still accept and has a little input from me. And in a way, this addresses also the idea of, do we work with the strategy or against the strategy? If we work against the strategy, we're going to threaten people and therefore they will be less um, likely to engage in reflective functioning. And therefore we're going to make them behave as they usually do, not uh, enable them to experiment with something different. Do I think any general digitally delivered therapy can be effective? On one hand, people are increase, increasingly looking online for support and arguably comfort, probably without knowing it. Well, a lot of people go online for pornography. That's sexualized comfort in my book. So it must work to an extent. Of course, is the issue of rep is reproduction. Staying online will not exactly work. It will not be as fulfilling as an actual physical encounter. If the problem is protection and comfort, then sexuality patches it up a little, but it doesn't address the focal problem. Um, my concern is that it reinforces the symptom-based approach, that is, self-diagnosis anxiety and deciding CBT from a chatbot or app is what you need and can afford. It's not an interpersonal meeting. Approaching this from another angle, I noticed that I feel I do actual work by phone or by Zoom with people I've met physically a few times. So in other words, from a physical meeting, moving to an online meeting, it's sort of doable. There's, there's something in place that allows me to, to, to carry on the relationship. The experience of meeting people online for the first time, I've had some spectacular failures. And the feeling was I cannot interact in ways to regulate the arousal of these people. They're too far away. I don't see or feel their body in the room. In particular, with a couple. They started arguing and off they went. No, no way of actually affecting their functioning. So I'm not convinced that digital, I mean, the app responding automatically is clearly masturbation, better than nothing, but you know, not, not the full thing. Uh, and then compromises can be, can be sought, they can be productive. It, keeping in mind that visual and auditory are two modalities, but we communicate in a variety of implicit ways. Mm. Being physically together in the same space has something to it. Is there a public health approach that we can adopt building on DMF principles? See staying alive, an agenda for the 21st century or something like that by Crittenden, uh, Speaker and Landini in scrambled order that has a few answers to that. 
Okay, I've talked and talked. Do we want to talk together for a few more minutes? I don't know what time are we supposed to wrap it up for good? Are we already beyond our limits? No, we're, we're not beyond. We could go for up to maybe another 20 minutes. Um, Andrea, I wondered, is there any training offered by FRI relating to DMM integrative treatment? No, not yet. Uh, the closest thing was probably um, some courses in um, family functional formulation that included uh, a treatment plan. At other times when we do clinical seminars using an assessment, we do case discussions and we explore ideas. Otherwise, no, formal courses, currently not. We've, a lot of time has been devoted to the development of the assessments and of the model. We've started talking about treatment more formally, not such a long time ago. So it's relatively young as a topic. It has the potential to integrate different models around the notion of the response to danger. So there is some attention, especially for, from some mm, schools of integrative psychotherapy or the DMM integrative treatment model. Thank you. I had another question as well. If anyone else has any, put them in the chat and we will come to you. Um, when you last spoke for the DMM community, you said that you were really into depression at that time. And <laughs> I was depressed. <laughs> you, you said that you were into it. And so I wondered if you had any thoughts about depression in the context of DMM integrative treatment. Give me some more. Well, I'm just curious about. I'm curious about what what was interesting you at that time, and I suppose what would be the key things that you would recommend people to hold in mind when thinking about depression from a DMM lens. Well, depression, in terms of uh, a state of um, adaptive failure by a strategy is probably something quite different from what we mean clinically. Uh, I want to go back to Bowlby citing Emmy Goot in terms of productive and non-productive depression. Sometimes you just have to slow down after a loss, after a major life change, which might be happening in terms that other people can perceive and understand or not. So you could be mysteriously, suddenly uh, depleted of all energy and other people wouldn't see why. Sometimes this is very adaptive. You need to regroup to withdraw your energy investments in your daily life, just stay home, sleep. Even if the, other, the outer world wants you to go back to work, it's just not in your best interest until you figured out in implicit integrity ways, what it is that you have to change about your organization. And sometimes you just come out of it spontaneously when you've done the implicit integration you needed to do. Other times, the depression is recurrent and it reflects a, a lack of efficacy in making that transition. So the, 
when I probably said I'm in favor of depression because sometimes it's just what you have to do. And I mean, I had a training in, uh, in a cognitive sort of therapeutic model. And there is an assumption there that if you have a problem, the best thing to do is try to solve it as quickly as possible. Sometimes the sort of neuro carry out in response to certain life transitions can't, can't be quick. It cannot be a semantic new principle that you put in, in place. Sometimes you really have to restructure. So maybe that's what I was meaning when I, I was talking about my interest or my advocacy of depression. Okay, are we ready to, people are going, they have families, relationships, or needs for food and drink. So well, we have one final question here, Andrew. Can we just cover that? It says, this is from Lena. Are there, are so many, there are so many attachment experts. Oh, oh, oh. They should go. Did I lose sound? Oh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, no, I'm the, the gut reaction is everybody's an attachment expert. Everybody who has heard the word attachment seems to know about attachment. So I'm currently dealing with judges who have heard from honorary judges that went home for a home visit once and they perceived that the attachment was anxious. Anxious ambivalent. Did they carry out a procedure? No. Now, if you're a clinician and form a working hypothesis, you can disprove it as you work with the family. But if you go to the judge and say these things and the judge takes them seriously, thinking they must be experts, they call themselves experts. Uh, and then the judge thinks, so I cannot allow these parents to adopt this child that they have fostered until now. Then I get angry. May I? So shaming moms, what does this have to do with being a transitional attachment figure. It's about protecting, protection and comfort. Is shame comfortable? No, they violate a basic principle of DMM integrity treatment. Out. <laughs> Is that clear enough? It's clear. They are not doing anything that is considered helpful by the model. Yeah, Belinda say something interesting. Uh, if working against the strategy at the start of the working relationship can create more threat, what might be useful when working with people using C plus strategy? Have a good fight with them. Who the fuck do you think you are? I'm the specialist, but I can be crazier than you. And now go to hell. <laughs> with people using C plus strategy, there, there is a point at which you can placate but you have to demonstrate that you can fight as well. If, 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 uh, if not, you're not speaking their language. There's, you stay on separate worlds, in a sense. Can I ask you, Andrea, about a link between sex and lack of comfort in the context of couples? We've seen a lot of correlation between infidelity and in couples specifically around a plus a six negative most specifically is this something you've seen in your work with couples or would it make sense theoretically that these people who are so independent and so disconnected emotionally would then turn to sex to help regulate those needs many things are possible with sex so within the couple they can stay independent and join through sex. And that addresses in a way, in a partial way, 
um, the, the protection and comfort issue, but it has to go through sex. At other times, uh, one person is particularly anxious and the other person has to accommodate their desire for sexuality, which is in fact desire for comfort and, and calming down. Sometimes the threat when using A6 strategies is intimate, intimacy itself, and therefore sex is sought outside of the couple. And that doesn't, that doesn't address the protection and comfort issue. Actually, the interpersonal searching for protection and comfort is the threat in the context of like A6 strategies. So it's a, it's a minefield. There's many Thank ways. you. You're welcome. Okay, it's getting dark here. Thank you for your attention. I hope I spoke to the topic. I hope I've made you curious. You cannot take any training in, in DMM integrative treatment, but there's a lot to read if you want to. So we'll, we'll try. If there is a desire for more work on the topic, we'll, we'll try to provide something. OK. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time, Andrea, and for your wisdom. <laughs>